system. So again, we have individuals flowing through, um, through these processes. There's resources associated with the processes. The limited availability of those resources leads to queues waiting for certain resources to be available. And the availability of those resources will allow certain processes to take place. A set of flow charts, such as we've just seen, are used to, used to illustrate the, um, the processes and their relationships to one another. What process takes place after what, after what. In a way, it describes the workflow that needs to be, take place to handle, say, a patient in their movement through the facility. Through the facility. There are going to be resource pools that are capacitated, in other words, that exist with a certain capacity, which if it goes to zero, if there's none available, individuals will wait. And those resource pools are, are pools in which there's interchangeable resources used so to allow an individual to go through, say, a process. And we're, what we're going to see is there's some logical notions of attaching or detaching a patient or a, an entity from certain resources. And that has to do with, in a way, reserving the resource, associating the patient with the resource for some period of time. So this notion of attachment, detachment, is, will be a very important one, having to do with logical association or logical reservation of a resource. There's also a notion of sending patients to, or moving, pa excuse me, sending resources to a location or moving patients or entities to a location. Okay. So central concepts, entities flow through processes and are processed at successive stages. Um, the flow charts specify the process of the workflow and entities, and resources are required for, for processes to take place. Queues are formed by entities waiting resources, and there's limited capacity pools. Um, entities interact with these resources by attaching them, getting logically associated with them, getting reserving them or detaching, and um, that takes place uh, through a notion, excuse me, attaching and detaching has to do with that resource accompanying the patient. I, I should be clear on that. Seizure has to do with um, being associated with, with reserving that resource for the sake of the entity. So we need to distinguish between those things. On the one hand, we have logical association with the reservation of that resource by the entity. And for attachment, detachment, we have the question, does the entity get accompanied by physically the resources they move around? They may have reserved that resource, like an x-ray, but it doesn't move with them through the facility. In other cases, they may have reserved a nurse's time or a doctor's time, and that, and that resource will move with them through the facility. There's going to be physical homes for resources where they live and where, to which they return. And there'll be movement along paths via what are called polylines. OK, um, to engage in this sort of modeling, we're going to specify a network which logically groups together entities, resources, and portions of the workflow. Okay? So that this is one of the reasons any logic calls it network-centric modeling. We have this kind of logical bundling of what processes are operating on entities, and the resources required for those processes, and the logical relationships of those processes to each other is described by a flow, um, sort of a flow chart of sorts. And we call this a network. And there may be different networks associated with a given model. With a, with a given model, they have multiple networks, perhaps one for each of several different types of wards. So you would have different processes associated, for example, with an emergency room in a hospital compared to a critical care unit, compared to an operating room, compared to a maternity ward. They would each have different processes people go through when they come into those locations. And so each would be associated perhaps with a different network. Okay, so let's talk about these. To do this, I'd actually like to open up a different model, as enticing as the, the trauma center was, what I'd actually like to do is to open up a model that's, that's of a more staid location, a location that will allow us to tease apart its workings in a step-by-step -step fashion. So I'd like you to go back to the example models, and I'd like you to go down to uh, the 
ophthalmology department. Okay, so um, so let me see. I think it's under how-to models and under um, excuse me. Um, okay, we may have to come back to this uh, experiments. Actually, you know where it is. It's in the example models I gave you. I'm pretty sure. Um, it's in there. It used to be provided in here, but um, if anyone can find this, I'd be most grateful. But I, I just don't see it right now, so we may have to we may have to load it in from the example models. Let's talk about each of these components. So, um, so this is a depiction of a network here. A network um, consists of resources on the one hand, shown in red, and uh, flowcharts shown in blue. And uh, you'll notice that the resources are described by a set of resource pools, which are depicted as, as sort of pools of sorts, where each such pool contains a set of these interchangeable resources. You'll notice there's also a set of um, uh, uh, visual depictions associated with this that have a, a sort of logic, a visual logic to their own, and that illustrate um, the space through which resources and entities move. Okay, so let's talk about entities. I've introduced a bunch of terminology. And you can think of entities as a type of individual. For the most part, they are, um, for the most part, in our type of modeling, they're going to be people, but they could be, in other cases, um, cars moving through an assembly line, for example. Entities are the central parties on which the processes take place. So they could be, um, patients in a hospital or clinic, cars in assembly line. They're predominantly passive from the point of view of this modeling. Things happen to them. Processes take place on them. A patient is examined by a physician's assistant. A patient is wheeled into an, uh, an x-ray and um, is, is, um, undergoes, um, uh, undergoes imaging by that x-ray or by a CAT scan. So the entities are wheeled around among a set of processes and, and undergo these processes. The patients flow through are routed around these flow charts associated with the system. So we speak of them being injected into the system at a source and they disappear without a trace at a sink. Okay? So entities have defined lives here. They exist only in as long as they're within this network. Uh, excuse me, as long as they're within this, this um, set of uh, portion of the flow associated uh, with our model. And they disappear after that. This is in contrast to agent-based models where often the agents will have long-standing lines. And again, we'll come back to how we can mesh them together. How we can retain information between times a person appears at a hospital. But for the sake of discrete event modeling, with this process-centric modeling, we will think of people coming into the hospital as just appearing there, and they disappear and go out of existence at the end. Okay? So they only exist for the duration of time that they're in the system. Multiple entities are typically in the system at any one time. There are different places, perhaps, within the, the flow, or maybe they're queued up at the same location. Okay? If we wish to maintain extra information on an entity, we can subclass the entity class. Okay? Um, so it is possible to maintain extra information about an entity so they're not totally anonymous, um, so they retain some history information. And you do that using um, a term that some of you will be familiar with, subclassing, within any logic. You create a, a subclass of an entity, and it retains information, say, on what time it came into the facility and how long it took it for, to secure treatment or how many times it's, had, it's been treated within that um, period of the hospital, being in the hospital. Entities here are often associated with a physical representation which travels around some spatial environment. So they have a depiction associated with them. So those are entities. Entities are these, in this case, individuals, but again, it could be, it could be uh, material things, uh, discrete material things that flow through a, a facility. By contrast, resources are what's were required to initiate a particular phase of processing. For an entity to undergo a, res uh, undergo a certain process, it needs a resource. For an entity to undergo imaging, they need an MRI machine. 
particular type of imaging, or for it to undergo, um, you know, a, a CAT scan, it needs access to a CAT scan machine. Um, so a doctor is needed, for example, to administer surgery to a patient, the patient being the entity. Um, an EKG is a resource required to record um, electrocardiograms from a, a given patient, the entity. A gurney or bed, which is a resource, is required for a patient, which is an entity. Okay, now there are several types of these resources, and any logic distinguishes three important types according to their degree of agency and their degree of, of to which they can move. So the simplest, perhaps, is a fixed resource. Give me an example of a fixed resource from what I've described. What, what's an example of a, of a resource that would be typically fixed? A room. A room's a great example. Another would be an MRI machine. Those are, for the, for the sake of these models, they typically would be fixed. Um, uh, so those are good examples of fixed uh, resources. There's a different sort of resource that's also passive. It doesn't have agency. It can't move itself about, but it is portable. An EKG would be an example of a portable resource. You could go pick it up and move it somewhere. Certain types of portable x-rays are examples of movable resources. A gurney is an example of a movable resource. The final type of distinction is a mobile resource. This is a, a sort of resource with agency, okay? So if we were to look in that model that, uh, at which we had been uh, looking earlier, and we were to go up and look at that resource at the top that we spotted, um, we could go and look at the triage nurse. What sort of resource would she be, do you think? She'd be a mobile resource, yeah. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, she's a, a resource that that can move around in a, in over a limited area uh, of the space. Um, so this is associated with the resource pool, which describes her um, her sort of characteristics. Okay. Um, so um, here we have these different types of of uh, resources, and. Um, uh, typically, a network is defined associated with multiple types of resources. So, uh, for example, and I'm going to go to this ophthalmology example, which um, I'm, I'm going to open. Again, for those of you who have the examples for this class, um, it should be in there, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Can anyone confirm whether it's there? It is? You cannot find it? It's called ophthalmology, yeah. You don't you don't see it there? Okay. Uh, we used it. Um, is oh is it under for sharing with cla within class only? Try looking on that. So there's there's under that. Um, I distinguish between those that are released publicly and and those that I share in class for you folks. If you go under for sharing within class only, I have ophthalmology department. No. Does anyone else have that folder? Uh, the one on the wiki, uh, the examples on the wiki. No? Okay. Um, let me, um, pardon me for a second. Let me, let me just uh, see if I can email these um, to, the, to the class so that you can, you can have, have at it. Okay. Um, okay, I think this is... Um, okay, no, that's, so pardon me, um, just looking for the class email, okay, um, okay, uh, no, um, parameter information, gosh, okay, here we, um, Okay, um, so I'm going to put it in an in a email now. Okay, so this 
this is ophthalmology. I'm pretty sure it's available somewhere within um, within any logic even now, but I, I don't remember the details of it. Okay, so that should be sent out to you on email now if you can get it. Um, I am going to uh, make use of it here. Okay, so. Um, examples. Okay, so within the ophthalmology um, department, what we should see is actually a set of, of uh, staged sort of buildings of this model that exhibit successive sophistication. This one here is, um, uh, is what's called main phase one, which illustrates the simplest form. And if we see this network, we see this network is associated with these resources, and each such resource pool is defined with a resource type. In this case, it's a moving resource for a doctor. A scope would be an ophthalmological scope, so that would be a portable resource in a procedure room, which is a static resource that is fixed. Probably I should make that clear. Um, so this, this should say static rather than fixed as its sort of primary name. Okay. Um, so these, each of these resource pools has a certain type associated with it, and then it has a capacity. And the capacity indicates the number of more or less interchangeable units associated with it. In this case, it's a capacity of five, okay? So there's five doctors within this facility. And there's no distinction made between those types of doctors. If you want to have different doctors that, um, that are reserved at different times, so that, for example, the same patient reserves the same doctor every time. You need to put them into separate resource pools. You can, however, subclass a doctor class, in which case you can, you can record more information, like the number of patients a given doctor has seen or what have you. Okay, let's talk about these flowcharts now. We're going to spend a lot of our time. So flowcharts um, exhibit the flow of entities through uh, the set of processes. They don't have to be linear. They can exhibit loops. They can exhibit branches and joins. But in this case, we show a, a linear case. So we have a start point, shown here as a source, where the entity comes into existence. And I want to emphasize this again. There's no pool of entities that are, that, you know, are retained between times. They come into existence and they disappear. There's no continuity between them, between times they appear. So we have a source, and then we have a set of stages, in this case linear, and then we have a sink where they disappear. Okay. Um, we can have a hierarchical chart. So in other words, we can have a sub-piece of this, of this process flow be defined by another flow chart, in which case we can place it in there at one or more points. And that's very useful because it's an element of modularity. You could have a CAT scan at this point within this flow chart or at multiple points in this flow chart, and we'll reuse that same structure, that same, same logic. Okay, uh, often we have branches, and we saw one of those earlier, and we have joins uh, such as we have here. Okay, Those branches can be probabilistic. They can be based on a condition, um, a complex set of conditions, etc. Now, in order to define these, we make use over on the palette what's called the Enterprise tab. And you'll notice there's a wide variety of elements here. So there's a vocabulary associated with this. There's a set of operators, to use another fancier word for it, um, associated with this. And we've seen many of them uh, already. So for example, select output, combining things together, um, the sources and sinks up here. Uh, etc. Okay, so I'd like to talk about some of the major <coughs> operators which folks here might be likely to use. Um, first, first is the source. <coughs> so a source um, defines some origination. Um, so if we were to look at the ophthalmology model, we'll find sources, and not surprisingly, at the beginning of each of the, the flows. And you'll notice that this source specifies the rules that govern the origination of, of entities. 
under what conditions they entered the network. And we can specify in, in with quite a number of, 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 of ways. So any logic is quite flexible on how it specifies these conditions. We can specify a rate. We can specify an inter-arrival time between, so the uh, characteristic of the time between agents. We can specify uh, a table that dictates when, when individuals arrive over time. And we can specify a manual type of creation. So when somebody calls the injection method associated with this source, then an entity will get injected into the system. So in other words, we can have entities coming at defined rates, or they can be injected manually, or a number of other opportunities here. Okay? So entities appear at this point. We also have sinks, and those are the, the flip side of that. A sink defines where entities disappear. And you'll notice that in both of these cases, I should have emphasized it earlier, but in both these cases, we have handlers. So for example, there's an on handler or on exit method here. And uh, excuse me, on exit handler. So when an entity leaves this source, this code, whatever code is here, will be executed. OK? And similarly, the sync had an on enter handler that describes how to handle it when they, when they enter it. OK? Um, You'll notice that also um, there's this thing, new entity, uh, here. Does anyone want to hazard a guess? What is this thing where it says new entity? Can anyone, particularly from computer science background, tell me what this is? What does that look like to you? language is that in? Java, okay. And so what does that do? Yeah, it creates a new object called of the class entity. So if you wanted to subclass entity, create, you know, a 1E e entity, um, you could have this be new 1E e entity. And it would allocate, you know, the special uh, uh, entity that keeps track of things 1E e is interested in. Right? Yeah. Um, Okay, so um, we, we've seen uh, sinks here. Um, let's talk about network enter and exit because this often is the immediate thing after the source. So ne network enter associates an entity with a network. Let me state that again. Network enter as an operator, which is somewhere down here in palette, it will, it will associate an entity with a particular network. Remind me again what a network is. What is a network? Can anyone remind me? A network is associated with what sort of things? It's associated with, okay, entities can flow through it according to a well-defined set of of, um, of operators. Okay, so so th there's typically a set of operators associated with this internal of the network. Um, that's often the case, but but more critically, even a network is associated with resources, mm -hmm. and it's associated with some visual representation associated with those resources, such as locations for the rooms and that sort of thing. And this network here is called network. It's just called network. And so here we're saying this entity is entering this network. And this network here might be associated with rooms in the maternity ward or rooms in the operating room, uh, so operating rooms, or, or it might be associated with rooms within the emergency department, okay? So we might have different networks for each of those because there's different staff circulating in each of them. Okay. Um, so here we're we're uh, we're associating an entity that's flowing through here. It's entities that flow through these paths here. We're associating them with a particular network, and you'll notice where they go here. It says the entry node here on which they they will appear is the waiting hall. 
did anyone get my the thing I sent out via email? Okay, so I'd, I'd invite you here to go down to simulation, and you'll notice that, like with all experiments, um, you have a, a it asks you which main active class do you want to choose. And you'll notice here there's three main active classes. You could choose which model you want to run, essentially by choosing one of those. Let's let's do main phase one, okay? Um, I'll, I'll double click on this, I'll put it up on the screen. It's a particularly simple sort of um, flow of entities through the system. And now let's run this. So you notice it says simulation colon main phase one. Okay, so I'm gonna run this and what we see here is, is a system where we have these ophthalmologists. We have an entity that's come in here, and we have these scopes. So the entity here is going to a room, and then they're coming out and leaving. Okay. Um, what do you think the name of this room is? What do you think it's called? Yes, Dylan. Really? Okay, so that's uh, that's mighty interesting. Um, g give me a second here. Um, let me let me just uh, see if um, if we have extra files that I didn't send along with this. Ah, layout. Okay. Well, it serves me right. Um, okay, I thought I'd zip the ALP file. Okay, well, it's a good example. Okay, here we go. Um, sorry about that. This will have the, actually, all I need to do, I guess, is to send along that extra file, right? Okay, so um, there we go. Let's, uh, let's send this along. Okay, resend. Uh, there we go. So, layouts. So this needs to be put in um, the same folder, I think, for it to work properly. Okay, there it goes. So you should be able to, to operate on it now. Um, okay, so um, here we have uh, movement of a patient through that facility. When we had network enter, what we specified was that they appear in the waiting hall. And if we go and we were to go look and for main phase one, there's a set of presentations and uh, there's a network group associated with it and there's a um, waiting hall here. And the waiting hall is defined as that, not surprisingly. Okay, um, but we'll come back, mostly we'll, we'll emphasize the logical connections right now. We'll come back to the visual elements in a, in a little bit. Suffice it to say that's the fun behind the scenes in a, a, so you, associated with the visual presentations. Okay, the flip side of this, ladies and gentlemen, is network exit, okay? Um, so uh, for the network exit, what we have is um, an entity leaving a particular network. And so maybe they'll go then to a different ward, for example. Or maybe they'll leave the whole system, which is the most common case for the examples here. Okay, another type of operator select output, and this is based on some predicate, okay? So here, um, and I don't think we have an example in our model, so I'm looking at the trauma center model. There was a uh, EC process, and there was this question, is an x-ray needed? And you'll notice that here you can test one of two things. Either you can have specify a probability by which it's true, so you just have a certain fraction of entities or agent uh, entity occurrences where this is true, or you can say if a certain condition as specified by code is true. So you could test, for example, does this entity have a broken limb? If so, an, an x-ray is required or what have you. Or, you know, do, they, do they exhibit these sort of symptoms? If so, it would be this, um, this sort of imaging uh, that is required. So we can, we can have them routed to true or false according to some fixed condition. By fixed, I mean it's specified condition. It could change dynamically into different cases or the specified probability. Um, in this case, it's it's a uh, it's a probabilistic thing. Okay. Um, okay. So that indicates which path do they take. 
Let's talk about a delay operator. Um, here's a procedure operator um, specified at this point um, within the path. This is a delay. So you'll notice we're in, the, um, in this palette in the uh, enterprise tab um, within the, the palette. And a procedure is the specified was, was, is associated with some sort of delay. And you can specify it explicitly or it can be dependent on some sort of um, speed and, and path length consideration. In this case, the delay time is specified by this, um, uh, by this expression. So in other words, we draw a delay associated with this uh, procedure from uh, a uniform distribution between 0 and 10 as continuous numbers. You'll also notice there's a capacity specified here. So that means up to five people can be undergoing the procedure at once. Um, excuse me, excuse me, I take that back. Up to five people can, um, can be, uh, well yes, it's undergoing in the sense that they're, they're awaiting the conclusion of the procedure. So they're undergoing the procedure. And there's also a, a checkbox you could tick if you want it to essentially be no effective limit. Um, so high a limit it typically isn't binding, which is uh, maximum capacity. Okay. This is a procedure. Um, okay, but we haven't really dealt with processes where there's resources required. And frequently, resources are required for a process. We've, we've just talked about these things. And I've, I've noted the different sorts of resources that are available. Um, so when an entity wishes to gain a resource, when it needs a resource for processing, it does what's called seizing the resource. It tries to seize the resource. Now, if it is available, if there's an, if there's an element of that pool which is not yet in use, it will reserve that element of the pool for that resource. Mm -hmm. But if all elements of the pool are in use and the entity tries to seize it, then they queue up for that resource. They wait for that resource. It, and they're going to wait until it's released by another entity. Okay. Um, so a seized resource comes out of this pool, and a released resource returns to the pool. And um, if you want to distinguish particular resources within a pool, they should be in different pools. They shouldn't be in the in the same pool. Uh, what's in the same pool is 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 interchangeable from the standpoint of who's selected. You can't you can't really determine who's selected there. So let's, um, I'm just going to run this, um, I'm going to switch this over to make use of main phase three, and I'm going to run it here. And what we'll see is that when we run it, um, okay, oh, I had modified this, yes. Um, okay, uh, here we have doctors, four out of five are free, now, now five out of five are three. Why is it only four out of five that are free right now? Can anyone tell me? Why are only four out of five free? Why are two out of three rooms free? Well, the entity here is going to be routed to a room. So they probably reserved a room, and a doctor is, is required for them. So depending on how many rooms are in use, they'll, they'll be indicated how many are free. And in fact, if you, whoa, if you click on this, that isn't what I meant to do. If you click on this, what you'll see is reports on the number of these that are idle, number that are busy, and some of these scopes. Um, and uh, it comments on, on the different uh, elements that are, that are free busy. Okay, so um, here, we have, um, uh, here we have some elements. You'll notice, by the way, if you click on each of these, uh, there's, there are some um, statistics given next to these, but you can also click to get um, information more clearly uh, printed out um, on, on each of these elements of the process. The incoming number here indicates how many agents have come through to enter, and this outgoing number indicates how many have left. This, this, so here, there's uh, 11 that have come in, 11 that have come out, but if we have an agent coming, an entity coming in, in just a minute here, and then they have to move to a procedure room. While they're moving, there'll be more 
that have come in than um, have left here. So 12 here, and now it's 12 on both sides. Okay, so we have these resources and the resource pools. Um, let's talk about these. Um, so we're going to talk about how agents interact with these resources, excuse me, how entities interact with these resources. So what we have here is this flow. So can anyone walk me through what's going on here? What's going on at this point? At source. What's going on here? Why is that there? What does that do? That does what? Yeah, that's where the entity comes into existence from the point of view of this model. Okay, um, network enter, what's happening? What are they getting associated with there? They're getting associated with this network of resources, the associated visual elements. Okay, okay now they start to enter in some, some flow, uh, flow elements specific to this context. This network sees reserves a room for them. That's probably the best way to do it. It associates them with a room in this case. Um, and how do we know it's a room? Well. In this case, we're looking at main phase two. So if we go over back to the model and we go to main phase two and we look at network C's, what we'll see is that network C's associates them with a proc room. Those who are in computer science background, particularly those who have seen Java before, what does this look like to you when you have a curly bracket there? Yeah, yeah. It's basically specifying an, an array that here contains only a reference to something called, well, it's a, it's a, it's a variable that contains a reference to a proc room, um, a procedure room um, resource pool. So this is a, an array in Java of, of pools. It specifies the pools that must be seized by the agent here. And again, this seizure occurs if they're available. It occurs immediately if they're available. If they're not available, they're going to queue up. And you notice there's a, a queue capacity here. How many people can be waiting here? If it's too many, then they'll leave. And there's a set of other, um, you see, if it's too many, it will overflow. Um, you can actually have situations where patients will balk. They'll actually leave. Um, and and there's some exist there's some cases uh, specifically where you can enable exit on some timeout. So if they're waiting too long in a in an emergency room waiting area, they'll leave after a certain period of time, which could be drawn randomly for um, or be based on, on um, some sort of uh, characteristics. Okay, um, so we have a network seize, and then we have a network release. The C is reserves a resource, in this case is a room, and release releases that room, it goes back to the pool. Okay? It goes back to the pool of procedure rooms that are associated with this network in which they're located. Okay. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about the operators associated with these resources. So um, Main operators uh, that we've emphasized thus far, network seize and network release, reserve a resource and then release it. Uh, for non-static resources, we can have a network attach and network detach. Network attach and network detach essentially phys physically associate that resource with the agent, so if the re excuse me, with the entity. So if the entity moves, the resource will move with them. And this only makes sense for portable and mobile resources. You don't attach a patient to a printer room. You attach a patient to a portable x-ray, to an EKG, you attach them to a doctor or nurse or PA, physician's assistant, etc. Now, if the entity then moves, 
then these resources that are attached with them will move along with them. Okay? And you can have this operator called network move to, which will move an entity along with any attached resources to a location. You can also move mobile resources to a location, network send to. Give me an example of what I call a mobile resource. It's important. What's a mobile? Give me an example of a mobile resource. Remember, I said there were three resource types. What are the three resource types? Okay, static, so they're fixed location. Portable, so they can be carried by somebody, the entity, or carried you know, in association with the entity, um, carried by a a doctor, for example. So one resource could go with another. But what's the sort of resource that moves around? It's a mobile resource. So a doctor, a nurse, is a mobile resource. Is a gurney a mobile resource? No. A mobile resource has, it has agency. It can move itself without help. It doesn't move in a disembodied way. Uh, it doesn't move in a way. It can move. It can move on its own agency, its own its own um, power. And so, a gurney is actually a portable resource, like a scope. Okay. Um, so, for a mobile resource, a doctor, a nurse, etc., we use network send to. Okay. Um, so the key questions here, or the key distinction here, is between seizing and releasing a resource. And the question here is: Is this resource reserved by, in other words, uniquely associated with the entity? for some period of time, okay? Um, uh, some period of time. Uh, the other distinction is between attaching and detaching a resource, which asks, will this resource spatially follow the entity, okay? Okay, so this is, uh, this is a situation where we have another flowchart. This is actually main phase two, I believe. Um, and um, we're going we're gonna to walk through this. So let's see if we can understand what's going on here. Okay, so we've gone over a source, network enter, network sees. But in this case, for main phase two, this is main phase three. For main phase three, for network C's, we're going to be seizing a program, a doctor, and a scope. So we're going to reserve, for the sake of this entity, a doctor, a procedure room, like we did in main phase one, procedure room. But now we have a doctor and a scope additionally. Okay? Um, and it's going to seize one resource unit from each pool. Okay? Um, one resource may be seized you know, while the others are we're just uh, waiting for the others. So there is the risk that it will seize one and wait for the other. Okay? Um, and we'll reserve that one until the other is available. That first one it seized already. Okay, the flip side of this is network release where it will dissociate the entity with, with resources. We saw that earlier, but note here that we have a release of all seized resources, because we have multiple seized resources. And moving resources, we ask what happens to them. Here, they're going to return to the home location. Okay? They're going to, so again, that's for mobile resources, moving resources. They're going to return to their home location, or they can stay where they are. Those are the ones with, with agency. Okay, so let's expand on this further. We have network seized. And then we're going to have this send to storage, which is going to be a network send to. So in this case, we're going to send a doctor to the storage to grab a scope. Let's just go illustrate what this looks like um, here. So I'm going to run this. And we'll, we'll run it slow enough we can, um, we can see what happens. OK, so we're going to slow this, slow this down. Let's hope another entity comes in soon. Oh, come on. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 
so we so we missed the, the key part there. But um, if I wanted to speed up how quickly entities come into this model, how would I do it? Can anyone tell me? Where would I go? If I wanted to make entities come in here more more frequently, yeah, I have to go to the source, and here it's actually specified as a rate, so I could make it as a rate one. What what would a rate of two mean? Reinforcing things that park all the way back to first order delays. What does a rate of two mean? What's the average time between arrivals if I have a rate of two? It's 0.5. One over point one over two, right? Means two on average arrive every time unit, right? Chance per unit time, yeah. Um it's a density. Time density of these things. Um, okay, so if I wanted to have uh, one arrive every time, one every time unit, now I can run it. Um, I have the luxury of running it quite slowly, and I can see what happens. So these things will be coming in. Okay, um, I'm waiting. Huh? Hey, come on. Um, okay, here they go again. Come on, there we go. Okay, so what happened is this doctor went here, came down. Now let's suppose I want to slow down how fast that doctor goes. Well, it turns out that this is all specified down in the in this uh, resource in the uh, resource area. But let's let's concentrate on the logic right now. Um, so send to storage. Here we have a doctor coming. When patient comes in, the doctor is reserved. The scope is reserved, the procrum is reserved here, and then the doc goes to storage. So send to is an operator that applies to resources. In this case, it's sending the resource doctor, <coughs> which is already seized with the patient. This is the, the, with the entity. This is the subtle thing, ladies and gentlemen. This logic applies, it's, it, it, it applies to the resources associated with the current entity who reaches this point. So if the entity reaches this point of send to storage, it's the doctor associated with that entity that is sent and the destination is the other seized resource unit associated with that same entity, the scope. That's a subtlety here. When the entity, let me say that again, when the entity, it's entities who flow down these, these flow paths. When the entity reaches the send to storage, and then the doctor associated with them, the resource associated with them that was seized earlier, gets sent to this other seized resource unit, the scope associated with them, okay? With that same entity. Okay, so it gets sent there. And now both of them are sent, again using that word sent to, sent to, they're both sent to the patient. You see, to this um, associate, excuse me, to the, yes, to the entity. So we're sending two additional uh, earlier seized resources, the doctor and scope, to the entity. Okay, let me ask you this. If, if you just had scope here, so you're sending the scope to the entity. What do you think would happen? Does anyone want to try it? Should we try this? What if, what if we only had it sending the scope? So I'm going to open main phase three. Would that, would that work? What would happen if we just tried to send the scope? So I'm going to comment this out, comment out doctor here. This is a Java code after all, right? Um, what's going to happen? Why can't, why is that bad? Can anyone interpret what's going on? Why can't I have the scope go to the page? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. 
Well, it's a lesson in reading, reading dialogues. Um, yes, exactly. So portable resource units cannot be sent without a moving resource. What does that mean? I mean, at an intuitive level, what does that mean? Why is it bad? Why did it not like that? Given the semantics, the kind of the meaning of different types of resource units, why was that invalid? Why was it illegal? Yeah, it can't move itself. A fixed unit can't move itself either. So it would have caused, if I had said, send the procrum to, to the patient. It, it reminds me a little bit of Macbeth. Um, for those of you who have seen it, where they said, what, until density wood comes to something castle and and, um, and people thought it was nonsense um, but uh, probably that illusion has lost the most people but um, it is in Macbeth um, so here the portable unit is not and a fixed unit cannot be moved directly the only types of units that can be moved are a moving unit to, well excuse me excuse me I have to be very careful what I said so why is it that this can move with, in conjunction with the doctor, but not separately from a doctor? Because it's a portable unit. The assumption is if it's sent with the doctor, the doctor will be carrying it. So it can be sent in the company of a moving resource because it's portable, but it can't be, sell it can't be sent without a moving now, if we tried to send a proc room together with the doctor, what do you think would happen there? It would say, can't, can't do. Um, it would be interesting to see what it would say, but um, I suspect if, if we tried to send a proc room together with the doctor, I suspect strongly that it would say, um, you know, that uh, cannot move. So let's try proc room, right? comma scope it will say can't can't do this okay so let's let's try that and then just waiting boom static resource unit cannot be sent to a new location okay so in short ladies and gentlemen the reason we could send a scope was because we had a doctor accompanying it who could carry it what's the assumption it's a portable resource unit so here we're sending the doctor in the scope, and that works just fine. Okay, so the next thing that happens is that we attach them. Again, what does that mean, that we attach them? Can anyone tell me? Are they already reserved to this entity? Yes, they're most emphatically reserved. That's why we could send them to the patient. They know who their entity is. That's why they know they're associated. The doctor goes to get the scope reserved for this particular entity. So they've been reserved since when? Since when have they been reserved for this entity? Yeah, from, since the C's. Now they're attaching to it. So what does that mean, that they're attaching to this entity? They're going to move together. The entity, they're going to uh, go together with the entity. So where, where, whether the entity goes, they'll go with it. So that's very elegant. Um, it, it, the entity, they'll accompany the entity. So uh, the scope will accompany the entity. The doctor will accompany the entity. So at network attach, we're attaching all seized non-static resources at the entity location. Um, or we could specify the resources to be attached. Again, if we said doctor, it would mean the doctor for this entity. Okay, so this is this is network attach. The next is move to proc room. So here, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing something different. The send to storage and send to patient were network send tos. This is a network move to. Here we are moving the patient. And with it, so we're moving the entity, and with it, all the seized resources that that um, the, the portable or moving resources that can accompany it. Okay. So um, here, though, we are 
We don't even have to specify that because they're already they're already attached. Um, and it will move along the portable uh, move and moving resources. Um, but <laughs> we're sending it to a destination. In this case, the destination is the seized resource unit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Network C's uh, up here should have had the proc room specified. Can you guarantee this with the uh, proc room already? Again, you won't proceed after this point until there is. So, in other words, it's going to block at this point. What if you cannot reserve a proc So, if there's none available, you mean? Right. It will wait here until one's available. But not only that, I believe actually it will seize the other resources until that time. So it will take the doctor. Oh, doctor's available, let me put it down under my name. Scope available, put it down under my name. It will just wait until the proc room. Just grab whatever you have. Grab whatever you have. Now that raises risk of what? Begins with a capital D, ends with a K. Deadlock, yeah. There's, there's some risk of deadlock here. So you'd uh, if if you have if you have them all ordered in the same way every time, so you always reserve them in the same order, that shouldn't be a problem. But you know, if one guy says I'll reserve the scope and then I'll reserve the proc room, the other says I'll reserve the proc room first and then the scope, you could get a situation where neither can proceed because the other has it. Um, but if you have them take them all in the same order, um, it, it should be fine. That's uh, so something from the system side. In any case, this is where they reserve the proc room. And to be very clear, if they couldn't get that resource, if they couldn't get each and every one of these resources, they would wait at this point until that resource is available. This point has uh, some kind of automatic queue. Correct. And, th and that's what, the, see this queue capacity? And, and if it exceeds 100, it will actually blow up. In fact, let's, let's, let's do that, OK? Um, so, so let's 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 make how how could we make this thing exceed the queue at that point? Yeah, just swamp it. So, so ladies and gentlemen, let's go to let's go get tons of people in. How are we going to get tons of people in really quick? Yeah, up the rate. Let's up the rate to. Um, excuse me. I guess I, okay for this one. I didn't change it. Make it arrival rate not of point two. But of, of, uh, I don't know, make it 20 or something like that. Okay. Um, it doesn't need to be 20. It could probably be three. It'll be enough. Okay. Here they, here they come. Look at that. Okay. Um, they're, they're waiting. Okay. Boom. You'll notice what this number is. Um, it's just, you see, you see it says 100. Okay. There's 100 seized right now. And a couple more came in. Okay, so three have left from here. Three have successfully gotten it. 103 have come in. So there's 100 people waiting. And then it blows up. Okay, now, if I wanted to, if I wanted to allow it so that people could exit, for example, if they're waiting too long, um, I could have this enable exit on timeout. And I could specify how long they uh, they're willing to to wait, or I could also I could also have a, a queue capacity that's much larger and just allow for many many more people. But the point is, there's an implicit queue, just like you said, that's there. And in fact, most of these operators that require things um, are going to have queues associated with them. Okay, if 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 you have a resource that's required. You're going to be waiting, and and you're going to have a, a queue associated with that. Okay. Um, okay. The flip side of this, ladies and gentlemen, is network detach. The idea here is that. Um, so so sorry. Um, not. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I had network move to. Um, not sure why we didn't have um, the procedure in here. So here's the procedure. So we move to the proc room. So we attach these, these things. And then we move to proc room. 
which was with a network move to. We had the procedure, which is, is drawn from a uniform distribution um, there, and then we have a network detach following that. And a network detach, uh, pardon me as I put this in here, um, for, for future use, okay, so um, uh, we have the procedure and then we have a network detach. Network detach detaches all resources. What do I mean by detach here? What's the significance of detach? Does that mean they're no longer reserved? For that entity? Remember the key distinction. There's attach, detach, and then there's seized and not seized, or, 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 or reserved and not reserved, which is uh, achieved by seizing and, re and, and um, releasing. So network detach simply does what? It allows them to be physically separated. So they detach all attached resources. Why would you detach these things? What sort of behavior, with what sort of behavior is that associated? Why, why are you detaching? Yeah, they don't move together. And, and really it's, okay, so you'll notice what happens here is that these, these entities come in and after some period of time, they, the entity gets released here goes back and then the doctor goes back and returns the scope and so on. So they're getting detached just so that it will, they can go back and return the scope. So here's return scope and it sends the doctor and the scope back to a specified node which is storage room. Do you see that? It says storage room. So it, it, it sends them back to the storage room. Um, you could also send them back, you could send them to the entity, you could send them to a seized resource unit, you could send them to the home of the seized resource unit, but here we're going to send them to a fixed storage room, okay? Um, and, and then there's going to be a network release. What does the network release do in this case? It does what? Releases the opposite of seize. So here it logically unreserves them, so they're no longer reserved by the patient. So it releases here all seized resources, and moving resources return to their home location. Okay, they return to their home. Um, okay, um, I have just uh, presented the logic of this. Um, we're at act actually a very natural point to um, to stop the um, stop the discussion here.